Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's chat with the expert. Uh, you are in for a real treat today. Our expert is Dr. Nolan Williams. Um, I am Dr. Leanne Williams, and I am the founding director of the Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness here at Stanford University. As many of you know, our goal for the center is to bring together neuroscience, technological advances, and new approaches to treatment to improve lives of people experiencing mental disorders. And now let me turn to uh, today's expert, Dr. Nolan Williams. We're absolutely delighted he will join us. Um, he is a pioneer of cutting edge in, okay, let's cut that one. I'll start the next sentence. He is a pioneer of cutting edge advances in transcranial magnetic stimulation and other neuromodulation techniques. And as you'll hear, he's leading first in world studies to use these new techniques for people with depression who have suffered from not responding to previous treatments. And Dr. Williams is a great example of advances in precision psychiatry with state of the art treatment approaches. As you will hear, his bio is truly impressive. And I've had the great fortune of collaborating with Dr. Nolan Williams, and sometimes a great fortune of being mistaken for him um, because of our last names, I should say. Um, so we've had some inspiring scientific journeys together. Uh, one memorable one when we launched a precision TMS project several years ago when we were focusing on anhedonia. He's an absolutely invaluable faculty member and an ally of my lab and Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness. And as you'll hear, um, leading some truly remarkable studies. So let me turn to um, Dr. Williams' bio and then I'll ask him to tell you a little about his journey because I know it's been a fascinating one. Um, he's uh, currently assistant professor within our Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at Stanford University, and he's the founding director of the Stanford Brain Stimulation Lab. He has a background, um, very extensive background in clinical neuroscience and board certified in general neurology, general psychiatry, and in behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry. So incredible um, qualifications and extensive experience but let me ask you, um, first of all, are you happy if we use our first names and we won't have yeah, Dr. Williams and Dr. Williams? Yeah, right. totally. That'd be great. So, Norma, why don't you tell us um, how did you get here and just the journey of obviously incredible training and awards and the choice of focusing on TMS? Um, why don't you jump in? Yeah, definitely. So I, I'm i uh, <clears throat> I'm the son of, of, um, of a... Uh, my dad didn't finish high school. My mom um, finished high school, but didn't go to college. I was pretty, it was pretty unclear to me how to, how to kind of uh, get into science early on. I was uh, fortunate enough to be in a, you know, kind of stumble upon a neuropsychopharmacology lab and did mouse uh, research uh, every summer during my undergrad. And um, you know, I got kind of some conflicting advice about what to do next and got uh, ultimately decided to go into medical school. And then a, a couple of years into medical school, I had this kind of uh, moment where I realized that maybe I should have gone to graduate school or done something different, uh, you know, and kind of realized that doing the, going down the research path was, was the way that I wanted to go. And, and then spent a lot of time reading, um, you know, reading and thinking, and then stumbled upon um, Mark George's uh, lab as a third year medical student. So Mark George at the time was, you know, full professor at the Medical University of South Carolina and was the inventor of, um, of using uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for, for treatment resistant depression. But, you know, this was um, 2000 and six 2007 and so this was pre-fda clearance and this was like super early days you know also sort of working with Ziad Nahas who was doing a lot of the invasive implantable side of things and um you know wrote a meta-analysis during a you know a couple of months during my 
third and fourth year of medical school and um, and kind of made the decision um, to do neuromodulation before I really made the decision to do psychiatry or neurology. Or, so that was a real um, key moment to have kind of to connect with uh, Mark George's lab then. Yeah, yeah, it was super, it was super critical because I, I had spent, you know, um, you know, I'd spent most of my third year of medical school and I, I was looking around and, and, you know, I thought everything was interesting, but I didn't, nothing really kind of caught me, you know, and then the, the neuro, the neuromodulation um, kind of caught me, right, and, and I was lucky, I think, because, because I didn't really have any pressure from, you know, a lot of my friends were going into surgery because their parents were surgeons and all that sort of thing. And this was really a very unusual path at the time. And everybody, all my friends thought it was kind of a weird thing to want to do. What are you going to do? be, you know, playing with magnets and all, you know, these, this was the view back in 2006, yeah. right? Of like, you know, this being a more unusual um, sort of career trajectory. But, you know, I, I kind of had the the view at the time that the most important thing was for it to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I took, took what I thought was a pretty big risk at the time of like focusing on this thing that had no FDA approvals and wasn't clearly going to even work out. And then, you know, once I decided on neuromodulation, then I went and rotations in neurology and psychiatry and neurosurgery and neuroradiology. And was really actually like trying to find a medical specialty that aligned with this Kind of firm decision mm. to do brain stimulation, you know, and then because you know, didn't was, have a, a discipline home, at, well, it still doesn't in it still doesn't many ways. Mm. So what what was it that caught you? Is it because of my like, brain or the that it made sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I I loved you know as a kid, I really loved um, kind of electrical engineering, you know, sorts mm -hmm. of things, right? So I you know I was always the I was always volunteering to like set up the, the, the at the time, I guess the States, me, the VCR and the, the stereo and like running wires mm -hmm. and do all this stuff and like thinking about electronics. And so I really loved that whole side of things. And so the idea of the brain being this, you know, wiring diagram and really thinking about mm -hmm. it from that standpoint, really thinking about brain conditions as, you know, many of them as circuit based conditions mm -hmm. for me felt totally natural. And then, you know, I did my neurosurgery rotation and, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of spine surgery to be a neuro, you know, neurosurgeon. And I was like, gosh, you know, it's interesting, but not as interesting as the mm -hmm. brain, you know, and then, and then I got caught into this thing where, you know, I did my psychiatry, res my psychiatry rotation. And I was like, I really like this, these problems, but I'm, but the way we're thinking about these problems doesn't make as much sense to my way of thinking about things, mm -hmm. right? And then in my neurology rotation, it was like, wow, that like this is the way I like thinking about these problems. But I, but I kind of see the neurology problems as being pretty, you know, I mean, they're not fully understood, obviously, but they're definitely more understood than than psychiatric illness. And so, you know, and and more I, I like, um, more part of the the clinical formulations as well as the research right? anchored in brain anatomy and kind of structural and anatomical understanding, which has not been the case for psychiatry. We're thinking from symptom first. Absolutely. And, and, and in 2006, 2007, 2008, I mean, as you know, right, you were, you were pioneering many of those studies uh, back then and planning iSpot and the whole you know, but, but that was still very, um, you know, still very early in the circuit story. And, and I think there was, it was less acceptance back then, as you know, than, than we kind of seem to yeah. have now. And so I think, I think that was a, it was a bet, you know, and I, and so, you know, I signed up for a dual, you know, psychiatry neurology residency in my, in, in, you know, Mark George had um, done that route and, and, you know, a couple of other folks that I met around the country. And, and I kind of took this frame of, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kind of apply some of the neurological thinking around localization and, and, and kind of thinking about brain networks into the, the psychiatric illnesses. And really, you know, I, I'm most comfortable when, um, there's not an algorithm when there's it's it's kind of still on the on the mm -hmm. kind of cutting edge of 
of what's going on. And so then I negotiated with the MUSC residency program. They agreed to letting me do this research fellowship like embedded in the six years. So I made my life really complicated for six years with a lot of training. Uh, you know, so I did all, a bunch of research training, clinical training and two residencies and all of that over that period of time. Um, it would have taken 10 years and six. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was working a whole lot. Um, I and... wasn't aware of that of that aspect of your training. I knew you had the dual training, but that you compressed it into 10 into six. Are, are, you, um, are you unique in having that combination of training? So normally the, um, <clears throat> normally the kind of time frame for doing that would be if you were to do two separate residencies, it would be eight years. If you were to do neurology and then psychiatry, it would be seven. And then, you know, I had a, had a research fellowship for two years that I embedded in thinking about 50% time. So it's, you know, somewhere in the kind of, if we were to, if I would have done this kind of uh, in the standard way, it would have been, it would have been closer to 10. The The combined residencies are typically six, but it's harder to get them to buy into letting you do any research because you got to yeah. combine all of this yeah. psychiatry and neurology training and get it all done. I was able to, um, to basically just work more and that mm -hmm. uh, allowed me to do everything that I, that I had to sign up to do, but you know, it was good. I mean, I think, I think I got it all done. I wanted to, be done in that sort of time frame and have have it um, finished up. And I, you know, and so in the period between med school and residency, one of my mentors, the Edna Haas, who was at MUSC, went to be a chair in, in Lebanon and left a bunch of, um, you know, very treatment resistant folks and implanted cortical stimulators. Um, and, and Baron Short and I took care of those folks in a clinic that I'd run for a couple of years um, during the latter half of my residency. And so I had this experience where, you know, a handful of people, very treatment resistant depression, nothing had worked. They got these cortical implants and then, and they got quite a bit better around that time. Um, the, the broaden kind of Mayberg target trial mm -hmm. had, had gone into futility. And then the venture capsule, ventral stridal trial had gone into futility. And so there was this kind of down turn of excitement around implanted devices for um, psychiatric conditions. And so that was right when I was leaving Stanford to come, I was leaving MUSC to come to Stanford, right? So I, I um, accepted an instructor job at Stanford 2014, and those trials came out. And, you know, I called folks around the country, calling Helen and others and said, hey, you know, um, what do I do now? And, and the oh, you should maybe you should work in Parkinson's disease or like do something else that would um, that that isn't going to be impacted by this kind of um, downturn in interest because of the not so great, you know, initial trial results. And so I, I kind of faced this moment. I was lucky enough to meet you around that time. You gave me a lot of great mm -hmm. advice and helped yeah, helped me in many ways. You gave me some advice that it took me a couple of years to kind of fully understand. <laughs> to so, digest. Yeah, I really appreciate and it. And Helen Mayberg, we should highlight, is, um, in my view, that the pioneer of the circuit approach to understanding depression and developing these new te techniques for treatment accordingly. So she's a wonderful person to get a kind of got career guidance from, that's for sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was able to get you know, her and Mark and others were able to provide a good bit of um, of sense of yeah. kind of where things were at. And so I took this pivot at that point where I said, okay, I can't, I can't run. I'm like, I had no money uh, at the beginning and had no, you know, really and nothing. And you're coming right? to and, a cheap place to live, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and no, <laughs> real out. yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting couple of years. And so I, you know, I, I kind of had to think, well, how do I, how do I go from this scenario where I'm, where I'm doing, you know, deep brain stimulation, extremely expensive trials, to trying to do something that bridges that interest, and, and still accomplishes a similar sort of goal, but doesn't put me in a scenario where I have to be way more senior than I am and have way more money than I did at the time. And so I said, well, how would we how would we kind of emulate an implanted device environment in it with a non-invasive device so that you could 
essentially create the same sort of conditions of deep brain stimulation with a cortical stimulation in this case, and be able to be able to um, you know produce you know what what we would hope to be similar sort of expected outcomes of being able to get people out of depression. And so we we kind of looked at that and said, okay, we have to totally re-engineer the way TMS is designed, right? And so we spent a year and a half just reading. You know, mm -hmm. so it's very not, I was not very productive. I was pretty unproductive during that first year, year and a half, because I was just reading everything that I could and thinking very deeply about the field. And I immersed myself completely and really kind of made a mental model for myself about how I was going to think about the the problem, which is quite different than the way that the rest of the field at the time were thinking about the problem. And so deep brain stimulation, there was this question of if it worked or it didn't work. If you believed that it worked, then it was this issue of targeting, mm -hmm. and patient selection and stimulation parameters that were the issue. And then TMS, it worked, but it worked in a limited set of people. And then the yeah. question was, is this an issue of targets in the sense of you need multiple biotype kind of targets mm -hmm. for each, mm -hmm. for each, um, you know, manifestation of depression at the neural level, at the symptomatic level or a combination of those? Is it an issue of, of other, you know, you know, features of the, of the illness that we don't understand? And so that at that time, the kind of how to make TMS better was this open question. And people like Jonathan Downer and others had taken these approaches that maybe it was a multiple target issue. And so when we looked at it, we said, okay, well, the thing that hasn't happened is there hasn't been the sort of pharmacology-based thinking that one applies to doing mm -hmm. um, our TMS. And so we we took that that thinking and said, okay, nobody ever has really done a like a standard legitimate dose response curve with our TMS, you know, um, like with meds, right? We escalate the dose, we try to get a sense of- Fascinating the, that that wasn't, wasn't the case. Actually. Yeah, the, yeah, the reason why, and it's a totally legitimate, it's a set of reasons actually, the reasons why are, are the following. One, the devices in 1995, when Mark started out, would blow up like regularly, and you had to actually dunk the coil in, in an, a, like, a, like an ice bath. So you had to take this coil, it's an electromagnet with a whole lot of energy, and stick it into a, an ice bath to cool it down. And, and then, you know, you cooled it down enough to be able to stimulate again. And so this idea that you'd somehow be stimulating in these kind of massive levels, your machine would be blowing up all the time, and all this stuff. And so they were just trying to get one session done. And then relatedly, the, there, was a, there wasn't a whole lot of information around what the seizure risks were. And back then, there were, there were a bunch of seizures that were happening because they, they were exploring parameter space that we now know were kind of off limits, right? Like you kind of can't do it in these ways because that's a higher seizure risk. And so at the time, you know, they were like, we don't really want to make this, you know, into something that causes a whole lot of seizures. And we can't even really do, you know, these sorts of extended stim protocols. So they, so, you know, either knowingly or kind of restricted by the, by the, the kind of setting of the time took a much, what I see now is like a very, very conservative sort of way of thinking mm -hmm. about it. And they went at it in that way, right? Using paper rulers for DLPFC average spots, right? Um, using stimulation parameters derived from parametric experiments and not from human or you know mammalian neurobiology and not really doing this dose exploration exercise and so basically what happened is um you know they remarkably i actually think it's really like uh, a testament to how how diligent everybody was at the time they were able to get an fda approval on something that you know some people take as being not as kind of optimized as, mm -hmm. you know, from an efficacy standpoint as, e as ECT. But if you think about, if you think about these approaches, they're not like pills, right? They're, in a, it's an evolving engineering approach. And so we looked at it and we said, can we reorganize this in space and time and dose and emulate an implanted device environment? You know, and so we, and I'll show some slides in a minute about that, but that, that was kind of the pivot. And, and um, you know, we treated a couple of people. I treated this guy who failed ECT and 18 sessions of ECT and 
bunch of TMS, and ketamine, all this, the VNS, 40 meds. And he remitted on the fifth day. And that's when I kind of realized like we had mm. something yeah. that, you know, because I, I actually told a guy that I didn't think it was going to work for him. I'd already, I already kind of signed him up because somebody else brought him in, you know, and, and they wanted him to get treated. And then I realized that um, he was so treatment resistant. And I said, look, I think you're too ill to get, you know, to get any better from this, but we'll do it anyway. So he kind of had a nocebo right. statement at the beginning. And he, I mean, he mounted a complete, remission it was super striking and so then so then it's we a real were in moment this. in time so um i, I this is such a, a great train of um hearing about the history and just that reminder that when you start something so new it, one of the practical issues that you have to face the, the cultural change in the field technical challenges the fact that the innovation happened and then you're able to think about how to optimize is incredible I'm wondering if we could very briefly backtrack and then continue um because I'm I'm aware that many of the people listening will know what TMS is but I'm wondering if we should just very briefly give yeah, a totally. definition or you could come back to that in the slides or whatever works yeah definitely so, you know, um, there's been a goal of trying to stimulate the brain in a, you know, initially in a, in an invasive way about 100 years ago with early mapping, you know, procedures during epilepsy surgery that ultimately resulted in cortical motor maps and things like that, you know, and so we've, we've been, um, we've been mapping the brain, uh, you know, for about 100 years, the the problem, obviously, with trying to map the brain of an epileptic patient is that, you know, there are less of them, you know, epilepsy has affected the brain. We don't totally know, you know, how that's impacted the cortical representations and, and people have seizures around those areas. And so, you know, those are those are kind of the limitations. I mean, I think the field has a pretty good, pretty good sense of that now, but it's not it's not a tool that's very widely applicable. And so then there's this there was this question of can you do brain stimulation through uh, through the skull, right? Through non-invasively, you know, through a device that would interface at the skin level. Um, you know, for a while, there was a goal of trying to do this with direct electrical stimulation, but the problem is to depolarize cortical neurons with direct electrical stimulation, that's the sort of intensities that burn skin, right? And so, you know, there's a problem there right where you know you, you have a kind of an ethical issue around safety with 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 stimulating with direct electrical stem so after a little while of exploring that um folks moved away from that and then a guy by the name of tony barker in the mid 80s said gosh we know about this faraday's law from physics you know that you know you pulse a magnet you can generate a current and electrically conducting substances and the only things that are really electrically conducting or uh, in the in the in the head or, or nerves and, and brain tissue and uh, and the CSF around the brain tissue and so the um, the skin the scalp the skull um, none of that's really that electrically conducting and so if you're if you were going to use a really high powered electromagnet you could effectively bypass all of those non electrically conducting parts of the of of the skull and the in the face and and just get into the brain in a non-invasive way and so there was this was kind of blasphemous in the mid 80s and there was a lot of people that were worried that this was going to cause a single pulse of tms we're going to cause a seizure which you know basically isn't isn't really a risk um in non-epileptic patients and so you know they um they were doing these single pulse experiments in, in 85 and what they found was that if you go into the motor homunculus, you actually can have the thumb, you can see a thumb twitch because you have a depolarization of, you know, the thumb representation in the motor homunculus. And so then, then it was like, it was published in the Lancet as a case, it was an aha moment and the field said, oh gosh, you know, we can actually non-invasively perturb focal brain areas. We can isolate the thumb, we can move the index finger. If we move the coil a little bit, we can move the wrist move the coil a little bit more so it really seems to be location dependent and then um, the second innovation there was what we call repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation so a single pulse does not 
change the brain. We don't, we do not believe this changes the brain network. It's simply a probe pushing on the brain network it doesn't seem to really do much. But when you repetitively apply transcranial magnetic stimulation, particularly in ways that seem to um, seem to be within rhythms that the brain understands to be biologically relevant rhythms, the brain like will the then electrical language in a way. It's electrical the... language, yeah, very, yeah. very simple electrical mm -hmm. language. Yeah. Absolutely, exactly right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so the. Um, the original parameter space was was just parametric experiments. One hertz, you know, one cycle per second, two cycles per second, three cycles. And what they found was at a, at a critical point of about five cycles per second, you you flip it from being inhibitory or depotentiating to excitatory or potentiating. And the readout for for all the original TMS studies was the amplitude of the motor evoked potential. So essentially, you put a, an EMG pad on the thumb you get a, a size of the thumb movement, the motor readout. And then if you do biologically relevant RTMS approaches, you can move that amplitude of the thumb movement up and down, right? And so if you do it with low frequency, what we typically call low frequency or inhibitory or depotentiating, what you see is you get an amplitude of X and then you run an RTMS approach through and then you do your probe again. And then the amplitude is one half X, right? Um, if you do ex excitatory, mm -hmm. then the amplitude becomes two X, right? You've increased the cortical excitability. And the view there was that that was a surrogate of changing brain electrical activity. And then in around 95, Mark George and people at NINDS and NIMH looked at this and said, gosh, you know, at the time, you know, as you know, PET and SPECT was the, kind of the, the the rage, and there was this view there was hypermetabolism, yeah, re reduced mm -hmm. activity in the prefrontal cortices in depressed patients, and and so you know, and obviously more complicated than that, and we know that now, but it was it was good enough to kind of allow for Mark to have this aha moment of if depression is a problem with low activity in the prefrontal cortex and. Um, and RTMS increases cortical excitability and therefore probably increases um, you know, metabolism, brain activity in these prefrontal cortices. If we can do high frequency or excitatory or potentiating stimulation, maybe we can correct the metabolic deficit or how they were thinking about it back then. Mm -hmm. and, and so RTMS as a therapy was born as a first experimental therapeutic published in 95. And the idea there is 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 a simple one, you know, activities down. Um, we've got this thing that can increase brain activity without causing, you know, in, in most cases without causing seizures, without causing any sort of change in consciousness, not without requiring any kind of anesthesia. The person's totally awake. We can do this, and then and then after iteratively after some time period, you should be able to see a, a improvement in depression if that's really true. And, and they did, luckily. That's, I mean, it's fascinating to reflect back on that, just what a profound insight that was. And totally. on many levels, like thinking about how it demonstrates that the brain really is constantly interacting and producing our behavior. And, and just that awareness when you think about psychiatric disorders. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's um, you know I think <clears throat> I think this idea that you know and it's evolved over time, but this idea that there's this interaction between the medial structures uh, seem to have more activity or more you know activation during sadness, and then these lateral structures would seem to, mm -hmm. to kind of be um, underactive, and in, in however way we're, we're measuring that, um, you know, is is an interesting concept, and it. You know, it's still and it still in some ways informs the the current thinking about what what's going on with the the, the therapies as we yeah. we apply them in, in kind of standard absolutely standard therapies. It also um, be curious with your thoughts as we go on. To me, it helps us understand the different forms of depression, whether we call them biotypes or just different symptom profiles, because you've got this in simple terms like an imbalance. Like too little activation in regions you need for keeping your attention focused 
and regulating your emotions and then maybe too much reactivity in other regions that are more re reacting to negative emotions and moods. So you get this different combination of those in different people. And then TMS makes absolute sense that you're able to restore arguably the regulation of those networks and how they interact through that electrical language and that you then want to make it even more precise because it's not going to be exactly the same imbalance in everybody. That's right. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, and it's really a it's really a you know it's an exogenous way of of I think probably what CBT does with turning on brain networks, but being able to do it in such a way where you know I I, I see depression as this kind of problem of a, a kind of a range of volition that gets impacted with folks in the kind of very mild range that basically have pretty much intact or preserved volition all the way to catatonia which obviously is, is a near loss of volition and um and uh and every you know everybody kind of falls within that that spectrum and i think at some point in depression it's hard hard to know where that line is but at some point in depression i think the idea that you you really need an external device that is able to kind of turn these brain regions back you know kind of restore brain regions back to the kind of language directionality um mm -hmm. that that kind of normal healthy controls have seems to be the right right kind of conceptual mm -hmm. framework for me and um and it's you know if that's true it's very it's a very useful um uh, useful thing to do and in my experience has been that um if you ask patients who receive TMS you know that have gotten better do you feel do you feel different do you feel you know some of the, the complaints that sometimes you hear from from folks about meds where they feel you know they don't feel depressed anymore but they feel you know certain other ways you know and it's that certainly not everybody, but you do hear this from time to time from patients. And I've never heard a patient once gotten TMS who said, yeah, I'm better, but I feel different. I don't feel myself, you know, right. you know, it's, it's, it's this, um, it's more of a, and, and, and Helen talks about this too. It's more of a removal of the negative, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and then folks just feel like they're back, it's gone. And then they feel like they're back to themselves. And we see that you know, first with the suicidal ideation, you know, I always, when we were running open label trials, I always to love to go in and, and um, check in with folks around day one, day two, they weren't even feeling any better from a mood standpoint yet. And I'd say, Hey, when's the last time you thought about and wanting in your life? And they've been thinking about it pretty regularly before mm -hmm. this. And they'd always do the same thing. And it was like, I mean, you could predict it. They'd look at me, look very confused and they think for a second. And then what they realized was they hadn't thought about it in a day or two. Mm -hmm. And then they hadn't realized they hadn't thought about it. Mm. That's, so it's like, that's, yeah. that's, that must have been quite, I mean, that must be so impactful to see and hear those experiences. It also, it really highlights that depression is not like feeling sad <laughs> or at least you know, that's not, it's a feature, but these are really profound changes in how you view your life and yourself and that it's sometimes really hard to re read them out or report them, yeah. but you're seeing that in response to the treatment. Yeah, that's, that's been our experience. Yeah. And yeah, totally. I mean, I think we, we don't, um, because we require people to come in with a certain set of clinical scores, they have to they definitely have to have, you know, the kind of a pretty, at least moderately severe, you know, version of the whole syndrome and have, have symptoms yeah. across the whole, the whole, um, you know, the whole modulus. What's interesting is in, we've, we've seen this Sean Siddiqui and Mike have kind of reported this, that like um, the spot that we stimulate looks like it really, and they've seen this too, and they call it this dysphoric cluster, but the spot really looks like it maps much better onto the um modris the montgomery asperg depression scale and not so well on the hamilton because the mm. the modris as you know has like a it's a much more kind of condensed symptom set it's really focused on the core depressive symptoms it doesn't really get into anxiety or somatic symptoms yeah 
So, I think so. that's that's key. I mean, I've, it's almost we could have another chat with the expert about the challenges of assessing depression using the symptom scales, Be, given yeah. that variation in presentations and the emphasis of each. So that's that's a key insight, especially when you highlight this volitional challenge, because it's that aspect of depression in my mind is not covered very well with some of our what are considered gold standard measures. Um, oh. you don't assess it. Is this is this a good time to show some of your slides, or did you want yeah, to fine. give more background? No, this is great. Yeah, I'll I'll put them up. That's so how much um, you could cover. Yeah. Um, so we, we call it uh, Stanford Accelerated Intelligent Neuromodulation Therapy. You know, so I, I talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, after the original RTMS parameter set that was based off of parametric sorts of, you know, try this frequency, try that frequency, step it up until you get to some point sort of experiments. About 10 years later, a um, group out of, of London said, okay, can we play mammalian brain rhythms back through the, the TMS coil, you know, ones that we've, um, that, that we and others have recorded in hippocampal slices of mice. And the idea there, right, is that, you know, they're, these are learning signals and so it's a it's a really weird concept and it's i think a little bit hard to kind of wrap your head around initially which is you yourself volitionally can learn right i can i can learn um i can read a, a list of words and i can memorize them but you can you can actually also seemingly learn uh a different way exogenously through brain language being played through devices into your brain, um, which is not something that people, you know, necessarily even feel super comfortable thinking about at first, right? Because it's like, huh, you know, these are not signals that are going to say, you know, you need to go to the store and buy a mm -hmm. loaf of bread and milk and all that. We don't, we don't know how to do that. They're um, not directive is what you're saying. It's not like, yeah, they're not directive in any way. Mm -hmm. They're really very simple signals. And they're only really two types that we know about at this point one is to turn brain regions down whole brain regions down or sub sub regions of of that you know bigger brain region and say turn on stay on remember to stay on or turn off stay off remember to stay off right that's kind of the, mm -hmm. the, the language statement that that we think we're, we're saying and so the turn off stay off remember to stay off is this continuous data burst and deep potentiating or inhibitory the the turn on stay on remember to stay on is the intermittent data burst and it's excitatory or potentiating the difference between the two is all in the in the timing is really in the the application of stimulation as it relates to time and it's a it's a it's an interesting concept right because we're thinking in terms of like okay we you know it, it's in meds it's like a dose thing or whatever and how many milligrams but here it's how many pulses it, as it relates to where they get applied in time. And so there are like five patterns that we'll talk about with this accelerated approach. The first one here is this really high frequency pattern, the 50 Hertz pattern, which is really local neuron um, effects, right? And I call it FM radio. So it's this idea of you're, you're really getting into the, the kind of local brain region. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's the second pattern, which is this five Hertz pattern and that's so you get three triplets at 50 hertz every fifth of a second. And the idea there is that you're getting um, you're getting a kind of AM FM overlap pattern. And so you're sending kind of longer range information and shorter range information. I think that's probably necessary. You need a you need the ability to tell the system locally to to do what it's going to do and then tell the system at the next network node you know, something, and then those systems seem to interact. And so that's, that's kind of the idea. And we know that from work with phase amplitude coupling and in, in, in humans and some of the Parkinson's recording research. Please, touching on that, Nolan, the, the phase amplitude coupling, in the first kind of phase of my research career, I focused a lot on phase coupling using EG recordings. And this same principle of how does the interaction between very high frequency amplitude, 50 hertz, 40 hertz range, how does that interact with lower frequencies like theta range? Is that really important for learning and 
kind of changing behavior or even having a kind of consciousness shift, which the answer in terms of those studies was yes. So I'm wondering, is it a similar principle or is that not related in any way? Oh yeah. No, I think I think it's all, you know, my my sense that's all part of the same same story, the story of, you know, we we're we're trying to have, you know, either the brain itself is kind of reading out in these ways to kind of optimally work, or we're trying to stimulate in those ways to work. And it's really just an exogenous playing of the hippocampus into the brain. And then and then seemingly like cortical regions seem to see this as is kind of innate language in the sense that they do what they're going to do when they see this as if they, they're seeing it from the brain generating. And if you do interleave TMS fMRI experiments and you say, move your thumb in the scanner or you do a TMS pulse that moves the thumb in the scanner, identical, right? Oh, and, yeah, so we know that whether you do it or the you get the TMS coil to do it, it seems at least from an interleave TMS bold standpoint to look the same which is kind of a useful concept around, you know, if it's ex exogenously or internally being driven, it doesn't seem, I, my view is it probably, it's probably matters less than you, than one would, mm -hmm. one would think. Um, and so, you know, a different way of looking at this, these are the old parameters up top, um, you know, and so this is, um, this is the form we'll talk about intermittent data burst on the top. And this is just a change in the motor evoke potential. If you look at you know, as I was saying, like 1x versus 2x, right? You've got the the kind of standard um, one in the middle with the circle, white circles, and that's 1x effects. And then you got 2x effects with intermittent theta bursts. So you can kind of double the the excitability of the system, if if you will. And so, you know, Jonathan Downer and others said, okay, if we just give this stimulation, this intermittent theta burst for three minutes, 600 pulses, um, will it do the same thing as um, as 40 minutes of the conventional thing if we do it over six weeks, right? Um, and they had the most compelling non-inferiority study I've ever seen. It's almost basically overlapping at every time point except for week five. Um, and, you know, a lot of concerns about people get 40 minutes of yeah. exposure to the TMS treater and all that versus three minutes with so the shorter one. And maybe that's having a non-specific effect. But didn't seem to really matter, right? You three minutes or forty, you know, over six weeks, and you, you get people better. Um, but you know, the kind of issue of clinical pragmatic, you know, how do you use this uh, stimulation approach still comes into play, even if you can shorten the three minute thing down, because you still can't use it in high acuity settings. And so, you know, I, you know, going back to the story I was giving you earlier, you know, about the implant stuff and trying to emulate, you know, a stimulation approach with implant. And the other thing that was very compelling to me, I was rounding on the inpatient ward a lot, extra get extra money at Stanford before for mood lighting and, you know, doing TMS. And, and back then when I was sitting in the room with all the patients and I started thinking like, you know, if we, you know, in addition to trying to emulate an implanted device environment, it'd be really nice if you could have a TMS approach that could treat people in these, in these kind of high acuity settings. In a crisis, so some, yeah. So yeah, in a, in a crisis, in a suicidal mm -hmm. crisis, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, I started reading and, and you know, ECT is the thing that everybody points to. Oh, ECT handles that problem. But if you, you dig a little bit, what you find is that of the 100% of the patients that meet Medicare, Medicaid eligibility for ECT, so they, they are sick enough to get ECT, only 10% of U.S. psychiatric hospitals have ECT mm -hmm. and only one-seventh of those patients within the 10% receive it. And so six sevenths of the patients in those hospitals don't receive it. And the ones that have, and then obviously seven sevenths and 90% of the hospitals. And so it's 1.5% of the Medicare, Medicaid eligible individuals for ECT don't receive or do receive ECT. 98.5% don't receive ECT. And so you look at that and you say, well, you know, we should just really drive up the ECT rates and try to figure out how to deal with that. But people have been trying to do that for decades, right? I mean, there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of studies published in biological psychiatry and all these various journals, like, and you see this flat line over 30 years where nobody's really moved the needle. The other problem with ECT works quite well and, you know, about 50% remission rate and treatment resistant Despite depression. The, you know, a lot of negative associations, very effective treatment if you 
able to access it and meet the criteria, as you say. That's right. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. You know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, had a big, you know, had a big impact on the viewpoint. That movie had a big impact on the viewpoint of ECT, you know, that Jack Nicholson movie. And they, and basically they, um, you know, that had a big impact. I've talked to, you know, Harold Sackheim and all the kind of ECT leaders and that really, the people talk about that a lot, you know, um, there's real cognitive side effects for some, you know, autobiographical memory, memory loss yeah. and, and this, and this kind of accessibility issue, it's, you need an yeah. anesthesiologist, people have a seizure, there are all these, you know, potential, very low likelihood risks like heart attack and stroke and all that, they're higher, but still, you know, reasonably low risks of cognition, cognitive problems. And in that package, basically makes ECT, from my perspective, not scalable in 2022, you know, it could be if, if perceptions of things change in, in 10 years, but as it stands, I, I don't see it as that scalable. And so, and so then it can't be that, and on top of it, ECT takes a long time. Even if it works, it can take 40 days. You know, people are in the hospital for 40 days. So it doesn't actually fix the health economics issues around long length like, of stays and costs. So I said, okay, well, we need to find something that can treat people in the standard inpatient um, stay length, right? Which in a non-ECT patient is seven days, 7.1 days. And so you have to be able to get the patient and see them, evaluate them, all this stuff, do what you're going to do, plan their discharge and discharge them in seven days, which really leaves five days, right? If you need a day on both ends. And so... Mm -hmm. So then we we looked this up. Okay, that's a that's a challenge. We got to figure out how to treat people in five days, and we have to treat them at a level that's similar enough to ECT to be able to get this done. And so we um, so you know challenge accepted. Um, and so you know how to how to reengineer this thing across a couple of different domains. And so I'll be talking about reengineering it uh, in space and time and in dose. So we'll talk about time first. And, and pragmatics. So, I think it's it's um it's really uh it, it has a big impact that you've thought about all of these factors, like the technological, neurological and brain, how to make it practical and and bring it all together in a in a new approach. That's that's a lot. Yeah, thanks for recognizing that. Yeah, I I came to this realization, and maybe this is from years of, of kind of having these experiences, but you're, you're never going to get any, any traction on anything unless you can prove that there's a financial yeah. savings at the level of the hospital, mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as getting mass adoption, specialized centers, maybe Stanford and other places, it's a little different, but to get mass adoption, you really have to show that, that health economics Absolutely. sort of, you know, story. And so, so, yeah, so Sorry, we, I know uh, you, I know this. We need to jump into this. I want to take this moment to um, mention and highlight and maybe a plug for a the VA doing a wonderful job on that approach of how do you establish the um, the access, the health economics, and the benefit kind of nationally. And and I think you know I'm part of a a national clinical program that's looking at how do you disseminate TMS across Absolutely. the country in the VA and then add the information that you're about to talk about these new approaches and add imaging to understand who it's benefiting and who it may not be, et cetera. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I totally agree. And uh, yeah, I applaud yours and, and, and the folks over at the VA's, um, you know, work in that regard. And I think it's a model for, for how we do this nationally and the, the VA has been an amazing um, ally to TMS. I think once they've you know adopted it in the sense of that there's you know there's coverage and all that good stuff. There are other insurance companies oh. that have really been you know have had kind of mass adoption, and so it's been a good couple of years because of a lot of these health economic mm -hmm. studies that have come out. Right. It's actually right. at the in the you know kind of years range, it's actually cheaper than than the meds. So so we we had this kind of interaction between pulse dose and intensity you know what's interesting is you, you know there is a 
more is not better in some ways, right? So there's a detriment of the of the effect when you start going into high intensities, and in, but you do need a pulse dose per session that seems to be a little bit uh, more, um, you know, more than the, the the original stimulation sort of pulse dose to really get that optimal um, excitation um, in, induction. And so we we settled on ninety percent at uh, 1800 pulses for obvious reasons. You can kind of see, see that, um, uh, the, the Taiwanese folks that had been working on, um, this, this trial, you know, observed a similar sort of thing where they looked at sham versus, uh, 1800 pulses per session of ITBS and, and observed, uh, um, an improvement compared to sham in that trial. Um, and, and once we decided on the, the kind of like, Super, you know, the the super high frequency kind of gamma, then theta sort of frequencies, and, and the intensity and the kind of pulses of that. Then the the next kind of engineering piece, once you know what the session looks like, is what is the interval between the session. It goes back to that whole learning story. And so, you know, these signals that we were talking about earlier that you'd worked on with EG, that folks had worked on in in mice. That's one part of the learning story. But then that's learning on a one off. And then the second piece is what we call space learning theory. And people have done, you know, psychological experiments with this. They've done, in this case, uh, mouse experiments looking at stimulating with intermittent theta bursts through, uh, through in, in hippocampal slices through an electrode. And the principle seems to be totally the same. If you take a bunch of undergraduates and you give them um, the opportunity to write out 60 note cards to learn whatever they're going to learn, biology 101, Krebs cycle, or whatever it is, um, and you tell them, you know, write the note cards, you know, out so that you have 60 of them and you look at each one for one minute and you do that multiple times. So every, the first note card is seen at minute one and minute 61 and minute mm -hmm. 121 and, and so on and so forth that you're seeing them about every hour versus looking at the same note card over and over again and then never looking at it again. You know, mm -hmm. the, the answer is obvious. We all intuitively know what the better method, right? It's the first method, yeah. right? Of, of seeing it and needing. And that's because of this whole idea of, of dendritic spine enlargement and, and protein synthesis. You need to be exposed to it. You need to be, you know, have time for your brain to, to deal with that exposure, process it. You need another exposure. If you do that in hippocampal slices with stimulation, you see the identical uh, data. It's just at a, a micro scale of, of needing, you know, an hour or so for dendritic spines to enlarge and for you to get an incremental increase in dendritic spines. And so, you know, that that next piece of the formula of, okay, we know what the session looks like. Now we know what the intercession interval needs to be. And it's not 24 hours like with normal TMS. That's too long. It's not five minutes. Mm -hmm. That's too short or 15 or whatever, you know, other people try. It's it's an hour, right? You need about an hour. And that's really the ideal learning. Um, Why do you uh, think it's one hour? Is what's it, that? Why do you think it's one hour? Well, it's a bit, it's between, you know, in this study, you know, for instance, it's between about an hour and an hour and a half. We chose the more like the hour because schedule for the day and I need. Okay. That makes sense. Like it's practical and as well as makes sense for the learning to occur. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think I, there's a question, an open question if you need, in some folks, if you need 90 minutes and, 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 and we've thought about that a little bit, but to make it all work, and I'll show this in a second, we chose mm -hmm. that. We still thought 60 was okay. So we chose that that hour interval and that range of hour, hour and a half. And then the second principle, so now we've got the, the session parameter, like what when a person sits down and they get one stimulation session, what does that look like? We know what the interval between session looks like. And so then the question is how many sessions? <laughs> how, many, how much dose do you need? It goes back to that whole discussion of, we've never done a dose response curve like pharma with TMS, and so here we said, okay, you know, look at this, you know, Mark, Mark George and, and, and Linda Carpenter, others published this data, and this is open label data. But if you take the brain sway non-responders and you just simply give them more sessions over a longer period of time, you know, two thirds of those people plateau out at the, um, at the nine, 10 week mark, which starts to be a whole lot more dose than what we normally give. And then you say, huh, like that may actually be the flattening of the curve. It's not really six weeks or four weeks or even some of the earlier trials were three and two, weeks, right? It's like 
maybe like 10 weeks or 12 weeks of conventional mm -hmm. RTMS before you start plateauing everybody. And so then you start thinking, well, gosh, you know, we need to, we need to really do this dose response sort of study. But the problem is, you know, if you can imagine this, like a 12, 10, 12 week RTMS trial, it's a hard thing to sign people up for. You're driving in yeah. from work every day, five days a week for, for, for three months. Nobody's going to do that. It's not really a trial that you can do. So it's not really a trial in the conventional way of doing TMS that made much sense to us. And then the third thing, so we've talked about reorganization and time, right? So now we have, we have a sense we have, a, have to give a pretty substantial dose. We'll talk about that in a second in this neurobiologically kind of memory system informed way. And then the, the next piece is, you know, everybody was really, you know, either intentionally or by default treating the left or lateral prefrontal cortex as one, one thing where in reality, it's two Broadman regions, huge span. It does, as we both know, it does all of these cognitive functions mm -hmm. on top of, of the, the, um, the mood regulatory functions that it, it seems to have. And so this is an obviously a highly simplified set of figures for the purposes of just relating the information and you know it's very likely that multiple networks doing this and multiple biotypes and the whole mm -hmm. the whole thing but for for our purposes we kind of took this perspective as a model for this particular way of doing the doing the stimulation approach so we said okay well the DLPFC in normal mood seems to regulate the subgenual cingulate. There's a bunch of converging data to suggest that. Um, if you have depression, maybe stroke induced, you know, some sort of external stimuli, new stressors, you know, early life trauma, whatever it is, the DLPFC seems to come offline. Yeah. And the subgenual cingulate seems to come up in an activity. And, and that's convergent evidence, as, as you know, around, around folks finding that that piece of things. And then the kind of simple model, right, is we can exogenously externally buff up the DLPFC, the, that buffed up DLPFC can downregulate the subgenual. And I like that model, because if you think about depression, at least that, you know, this say biotype of depression being a problem of, of needing that cortical region to come online mm -hmm. and needing this, this subject subgenual region to kind of come more offline stimulating directly in the subgenual may or may not deal with right. the cortical right. piece but if you can buff up the cortical piece and it's in, in its innate role is to downregulate subgenual yeah. then that may be the you know the, the move yeah it's a really interesting approach um a quick and relevant side note in the um in the trial we're doing with that va um national program also, this using the standard TMS, but stimulating that region and then looking at scanning to see if the, the veterans who are responding with that protocol actually have more of this loss of inhibition. So a kind of oh, cool. poor cognitive control, so to speak. And you would, if you can restore that with the TMS, is it is it those folks in particular who are going to benefit early or... Are they the ones who may need a longer, um, a longer series of stimulations to reach that plateau? So it's a, yeah, it's a similar principle, but applied with the, with the standard approach. Totally, yeah, and, and yeah, I think that that's that kind of segues well into this. You know, this has been replicated I think, seven times. This um, this finding of of exactly what you're saying, right? You put the coil in the standard spot, and you just kind of see you know, where it is relative to other brain networks. In this case, it was this DLPFC subgenual, but cognitive control mechanisms, but it's a useful, it's a useful method to kind of um, looking in a retrospective sense at where things are relative to where you just happen to place it based off of the paper ruler measurements that we use in standard practice for TMS. And, and what folks have found here is that this subgenual DLPFC connectivity is, is uh, correlated with better depression outcomes and there's a, a recent replication of this that that mike and, and sean Siddiqui had where where the the correlation was much even much tighter than this right uh all the remitters seem to have that you know um you know very good dlpfc subgenual connectivity it happened to be right under or near the coil and so 
you know, we actually didn't have this information. We started out, but there was, you know, Mike had hy hypothesized this and shown some compelling evidence of this back in 2015. And it was the best shot that we, you know, guessed that we had at the time. So we used hierarchical clustering to cluster similarly behaving voxels in with a correlation coefficient of 0.5 to kind of cluster them, um, you know, roughly in about seven clusters in DLPFC, more in the subgenual, and then uh, in a decision algorithm asking, um, you know, how anti-correlated, how large these are, and then the decision rate, uh, algorithm automates uh, a, an output of a target. And so really, you know, going back to this idea that we did is we reorganized TMS in time and space and dose and made it look a whole lot more like deep brain stimulation because we individualized it based off of the patient's native physiology. And then we gave them, a, you know, we we're giving them a very, a, in this case, a very aggressive stimulation um, approach. So so each day is a six week course of intermittent theta burst. So what you're giving over at the VA, um, if you're giving intermittent theta burst, which you're giving over the VA in six weeks, we're giving in a day, um, you know, or if you think about it with conventional RTMS, 90,000 pulses is a six week course. And we're giving that over five days. So it's a pretty dramatic dose. It's about seven and a half months worth of ITBS in five days. You know, so you can imagine the things that people used to say to me at posters about <laughs> doing this. <laughs> and whether this well, anytime you're doing something new, I think right, it's it's a it's a big change. So it takes a while to have all those conversations and people's reactions and totally. And you know, and everybody asks, why do you think you can do this and say yeah. well, one, we've done it with implanted cortical paddles much longer and many more pulses per their total lifetime of having this and no problems. And then, and then the other piece was we were, we started out doing it in this kind of the sickest of the sick folks, like this gentleman I was I'm, telling you about that yeah. failed ECT. I was going to bring that up that if, and correct me if that, if I have a wrong understanding, but that's, I think, been really key to showing you can make a difference for these folks and that it's not like you're saying this will be the first trial of TMS if you failed one or two medications. These are really unwell people yeah our initial group was was folks that met helen mayberg's dbs criteria and we wanted to do that because we wanted to we wanted to justify it right there's a bleed risk with dbs and so you know in on balance this seemed to me to be at least as safe if not safer and, and it's proven out to look like it's it's safer in the sense we haven't had any major major issues just another way of looking at this reorganization of time in space and dose, um, you know, so this is the recent um, tr uh, randomized controlled trial results. And about 30 people come through, 50% um, of them were un unemployed due to depression. They'd had about 26 years of depression lifetime. They were about nine years in the current episode, so quite severe. They came in with a moderate in the mid thirties. And we had this very dramatic uh, separation from sham. And so all the Depression aficionados wrote me and they they asked the less uh, less apparent question on initial review of this. Everybody was looking at the white white boxes, but but all the depression aficionados were looking at the black sham box, yeah. you know, circles and saying, how did you do that? I said, well, we found this paper where um, if you look at the kind of moderate to severe treatment resistance, you use a multi refractor in a scale, you can actually you can actually take out you know, in the mild, you know, low treatment resistance, the Maltzley, the active and sham had the exact same uh, efficacy rates. I mean, people t say, oh, TMS is placebo. Right? They're kind of right in the sense that in the like low treatment resistance mm -hmm. people, you have a floor effect and you don't really get a difference, at least in that study between active and sham receiving um, low Maltzley, like very mildly to no, you know, almost treatment naive people. But if you take moderate and severe people and you look at that, those kind of subgroups, the moderate, the sham had some effects, but then when you got into the severe treatment resistance, mm -hmm. it was literally the same moderate score at every time point for the sham. And you got some movement in the, in the, uh, in the active group only there, right? And so this idea that you really got to pick the sweet spot of treatment resistance yeah. and then have a, you know, it, to me, it's having a probe that's powerful enough. Mm -hmm. that if if this person is a dlpfc person you're going to move them if they're movable and then um and then having 
picking people that are, that are only going to move with active. And, that, and mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. And I feel like we did a pretty good job of it. The effect sizes in here were 1.3 to, to 1.9. Yeah, um, it's, it's really um, highlights the point about that the treatment for depression really is not a one size fits all. You've really clearly spelled out these are people who need it seems like it would need this higher do or more concentrated dose, if I could say it that way. Yep, yep. And that um, that's not necessarily going to be the same approach if it was someone coming in early, early in trying treatments for depression, um, potentially not the same dose regime that you consider, or maybe that you are thinking of. This could be maybe I'll phrase it a different way are you thinking that this could be more a form of depression that's involving this DLPFC SGACC or do you think it's that plus the kind of build-up of resistance that's making that particularly intractable that is the key to how responsive the folks are to this to your treatment yeah that's a great question or, or something or another option yeah, totally. No, you're you're spot on. Now, I think it's it's that. So there there's this question of of chronicity and severity and time in illness and dose, right? That we we have some sense of now, but we don't have a we don't have enough data to be able to say, hey, look, like it, you know, we see it as relatively linear, you know. But mm -hmm. hey, look, they you know people that are more treatment resistant respond later in the week. They have a less durable effect. You know, there are some outliers on that. But, but it, on the, as a generality, we have a, a sense that that's the case. And hopefully in these bigger data sets, that's really, that plays out. And then, and then it's this issue of, you know, when do you, when you come in, n no one has ever really tried to do TMS and treatment naive people for the reason I was talking about earlier around that mild, you know, Maldsley, and mm -hmm. you get into this thing of like, the, I think the sample size to do, to do those trials ends up being so large that you can't, you can't do them with the budgets that it takes to do these really massive, very involved protocols. And so it will always be that, in my view, that this is going to be in a treatment resistant population for an outpatient setting. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an open question, right? If you, you're talking about inpatient, you're talking about suicidal ideation, doesn't really respond to much of it. No, meds don't really seem to do anything for that. And, you know, may, except for maybe, maybe esketamine a little bit. And, ECT maybe, you know, do, do you, could you do a treatment naive individual there? We had one in a pilot on the inpatient unit and he um, just, you know, he was from a country that never really had much in the way of access to, to medical psychiatric care and came to the US and had this really bad suicide attempt. And, um, and then he, he enrolled um, was med naive at the time and he remitted in like six hours you know so he was he was actually like a 40 on the moderate so really bad and he went from from really bad to um to to totally normal in six hours really really striking the bipolar patients seem to do that too um sometimes really, to me it speaks to this um focus on how do you get a better indication earlier in someone's you know when they're first experiencing depression of what form of depression is it and out of all the options we have, of which, as you're highlighting, TMS is so important, are there for some people um, reasons why you why you make a, available TMS standard or TMS accelerated available earlier? Totally. Um, um, one question would be because you you're acquiring imaging data to target the TMS. Could you think of that in the future um, as another way to help identify who might be most suitable for different doses of TMS? And this obviously is a topic I'm really interested in, but I know you are as well, because to me that speaks to the case for making access to tests or imaging more accessible for psychiatry. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there's a, as you know, right, there's this this kind of uh, story with an epilepsy, right, where if you have mesial temporal sclerosis on imaging, then we know that the chances that oral 
anti-epileptic drugs have an exceedingly low chance of, of you know, um, causing, you know, having a, a full-on seizure freedom for people. And so, you know, in the kind of one, I think it's like one to 3% range, right? And so you, mm -hmm. you see that on imaging and you say, oh gosh, you know, you've got a surgically fixable hippocampal sclerosis that you can have seizure freedom from if you go and you do this very dramatic brain surgery way before you normally would when you have people do all these medications, right? It's this idea that, you know, is there a scenario where imaging, you know, does get introduced earlier? And I think, I think that the nice thing about, about this approach as it relates to the kind of regulatory processes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that it gets, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't have to go through the rigor of, from the FDA standpoint of it being like, an independent full-on biomarker test, right? It, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm sure, you know, it's it, all of these, these things that they want. It's more like seen as, you know, Mike and Sean wrote this really great editorial about this. It's not seen as kind of the internal medicine blood sugar test. It's more seen as like the surgical planning, you know, component of the procedure. And so because of that, it's kind of seen within the context of the procedure. And I think you're, you're spot on that what, what happens, right? Is that we have we have this, you know, what I would see is a, you know, relatively simpler task of, of in a depression agnostic way of finding these two, these two nodes that are connected in this way that we, we want to see. And then build on top of that, this platform of other imaging modalities that you could then bake into the entire, you know, the entire yeah. process to be able to really do a dense um more dense research even within you know at scale within mm -hmm. you know tens to hundred you know whatever however this plays out you know across multiple scanners you know us maybe eventually internationally and so i think that's really the the beauty of this is it's a vehicle for neuroimaging um research too right and we could really try to answer some of this um built off of the back of of you know this kind of surgical planning sort of way of thinking about uh, getting TMS into that right, right spot. And I, and I think that's a really, um, you know, I'm really excited about that, you know, working with, with, with folks like yourself and others to really think about how to best, um, you know, kind of capitalize on that base um, set of scans and, and think with neuro, neuroradiology friends, like our, you know, like some of the folks we've, we've worked yeah. with like Max Wintermark and others around how to, how to take that to the next step and how, how neuroradiology would see it. But yeah, I think it's, it's a really sweet, um, it's a really sweet way of kind of getting the foot in the door, I think, and really trying to, trying to, you know, build off of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're really leading the way. And as you say, building off of how these procedures and flows are implemented, clinical flows in other areas, we can benefit a lot from that. And fact that you have the kind of multiple background in your, multiple um, areas of training you're in a great position to do that speaking of which I'm very mindful of your time <laughs> um, we could we could talk for hours on this fascinating topic and your work is it just brings up so many interesting questions and options for the future I'm wondering in thinking forward um do you, do you have a kind of dream next project or um, if you could wave a magic wand, yeah. what would you want to happen? And if you want to just touch on any challenges that you think need to be solved to make it happen and including any way that having a collaborative network through a center like the Precision Mental Health and Wellness Center can do that. Um, but mostly like what's what's your dream? Where, yeah. where would you like to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, you know, for the for this particular set of work, you know, the next step is that group of people that we were talking about, the failed ECT and all that, that have these mm -hmm. really, really robust but not non-sustained, kind of non-durable effects. And so, you know, they they would need a whole lot of TMS to stay well, and they're really that kind of implant implant category. And so you know, been working with you know, loads of folks, you know, in industry and within Stanford around thinking about how do we build a, an implantable device for that most severe group that, 
um, that basically emulates in an electrical way what we're doing with induced current with, with TMS so that you have the ability to pick winners uh, with TMS and then enroll those people in a trial to get to get an invasive ongoing stimulation. And so we've been working on that. I actually was just <laughs> meeting on that right before before this call. And so this, you know, it's 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 kind of in process and it was really, really cool to see. So we're calling it I Saint, you know, uh some mm -hmm. implantable saint. Um, and so that's that's coming along kind of very early days there. Um, you know, and I think I think that part of the dream of being able to being able to have a platform technology that can cover one med failure all the way to to kind of the worst of the worst and be able to find a sweet spot where you go from one um, hardware solution to another has been a dream and gets back to that original goal of trying to do DBS and, and then mm -hmm. going down this route and then kind of building a system that can then go back invasive. And that's the that's been the long range dream. And I I'm inspired by the by the cardiologists who you know, are pretty agnostic to, you know, I think in psychiatry, we have this kind of, it's, it's kind of, to me, kind of a, a more unusual way of thinking about things where the, the people doing the psychedelic work are kind of like, this is the thing, but then this other thing's not the thing. Track, yeah. Yeah. And the neuromodulation folks, mm -hmm. well, the psychedelic thing's not, the th you know, and it's like, and there's some of us that kind of see it all, but, I, but I'm like, look at the cardiologist. They're never like that you know, that defibrillator, that's the thing, but this pacemaker is not the thing. And this med right. is not the right. thing. Right. And so this dream of having a suite of tools, right. I mean, maybe it's invasive and yeah. non-invasive and psychedelics and the whole, the whole thing and being able to say ready to that, that dream. Yeah. yeah. I really like how you describe it because it also means um, you, you, you're also doing better for the patients ultimately, or arguably because you you've got a means to have the different options available and I wonder if because it's obviously not through any lack of dedication or caring in our field it's it's been a such a challenge but I wonder if the difference with cardiology is we haven't had a common way to really conceptualize the disorders at least not in terms of how the brain's functioning how it connects to behavior and mood and thinking whereas that seems to me is emerging and you you give a beautiful example of that like we have a a way to understand it that could then be um this kind of platform totally for multiple I, options yeah I, I think you you nailed it i mean it's totally i think we see it the same way i think it's a conceptualization issue i mean you know as you probably saw too there was this big you know big kind of twitter explosion about this this recent um you know ssri paper and this whether or not there's a serotonin deficit or not. And I think, I think it, it, to me, the meta thing there was exactly what you're saying. We're still not in a place where we have a, we have enough of a sense of what, even what depression is to be able to, to say definitively, you know, one thing or another. And I think that's really the, the place that we're at. And, and I think that that's exactly to your point, why people hold, you know, one view or another. I think, I think for me, it's, I'm coming from a, I'm not coming from a, a conceptual place as much as I'm coming from a tool building place. Right. It's, right. And so for mm -hmm. me, it's much more like, you know, I don't, I'm not wedded to any conceptualization of depression. I, I use conceptualizations because it helps me to think about how to build the tools or how to find tools or whatever it is in the case of psychedelics. But it, but it doesn't, uh, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not wedded to any conceptualization of depression. And so I just want to make useful tools. And I think that's to your, your next, your other point about, of having collaborative networks and having these, these kind of integrated, um, you know, programs like your center, that, that's why I think that really is important because I don't think that the tool builder or the, or the, the network uh, mapper or the, you know, I think we all have to work together on the sense of really trying to to test these questions because you know i can only i can get decently far i think with tools but I, I i won't get the whole way with tools i'll need you know i'll need network i'll need mappers i'll need you know you know we, we need to work kind of all need to work together to be able to to solve i think to solve the problem because it's such a hard problem it's so much harder than you know the cardiologists in some ways have it easy you know because they they have had this ekg for a long time 
Um, and so I think the problem's just harder too. And um, and yeah, I think we'll get to a point. I'm I'm hoping. I'm still. I've I've been. I've been I'm like, confident you will get there. I can I can see you. You you've got the. You already know how it needs to unfold, and yeah. you've clearly got the motivation and the expertise and the just the sheer kind of willingness to build the tools. I think that's that's key. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Is there anything that I'm sure there's many things? Is there uh, some aspects you'd want to highlight about what you, what's needed? Like, is it anything you want to touch on there about why it's so hard? I'm assuming it's hard and that you've really had to kind of build this as you go, literally. Yeah, I mean, I think the big, and we've talked about this a bit, I think the big, the issue has been that there's the structures that need to be in place to do these kind of trials are so massive and so expensive. And unless you're the, the powers that be are are kind of on the serious, you know, clinical trial mode side of things, which we've been lucky that we have, we have leadership that has seen that, but, but to, you know, to, ha you, ha you really have to have, you know, the, the level of support, not just, you know, I support you, but intellectual, financial support and infrastructure around building these systems because we basically had to build an independent clinic structure you know i mean to, to run these trials because i mean we are way more active than the than the stanford tms uh service right as far as running people and the number of subjects that we run compared to patients over there we have more chairs and more spaces and it's not not because we're competing it's just because that's what's net that's been what's necessary to do these trials and what we've really had to build up. So I've had, you know, that was a big challenge of kind of building this system. And then now really thinking about, you know, working with groups on how to use it and then really trying to get to emulate that. The other piece is around, you know, engagement of, of, of industry, you know, uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have issued patents on a lot of the stuff and have, have a startup spin out with some of my students over there doing doing the um, you know doing the work and trying to commercialize this and really trying to get it out in a big way and get get the FDA involved and all that good stuff and so that to me is the other challenge it it's all been ultimately successful because I'm stubborn but it but it um, but it you know it took years it took years yeah. for for both of those things to get built out and I think I think that getting getting a you know enough data and, and getting enough info out there and then really really kind of pushing this idea of, of interventional psychiatry as being you know the tool part of this relationship mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. and really trying to get you know groups of people to buy in in a big way to to that being a real thing and that being something <clears throat> that's something that maybe eventually has a board certification and all that but something that you know, people identify as and people want to go to, to train, you know, to train and going back to my like med school days that the kind of eventual vision of having, you know, our own subspecialty of this and being able to, to say this is this is kind of what we do. And, and the, I think the luck is that NIH seems to really uh, have a similar vision, right? And Josh mm -hmm. Gordon calls himself a circuit psychiatrist, as you know, mm -hmm. and so so this idea that um, you know that, that at least that group is is fully seemingly on board from what I've my interactions with them they've been super supportive and I and I think for for all of us and I think I think trying to to really get that at the level of the department um, you know and and trying to make these things from a medical economic standpoint you know profitable will go a long way for the hospital CEOs to really. To really adopt it and i think those are the those are the hurdles that's that mm -hmm. to me that's kind of the big and then you know the next steps of saying okay yeah we've we've done this with neuromodulation there's this whole other story with a psychedelic story and how does how does that play out and how to how do how do we think about that as a tool and so i think those are the those have been the the kind of uh, the various you know kind of focus areas and and have been fortunate enough to get, you know, a lot of great mentorship and advice from from senior folks like yourself and Alan and David Spiegel and, and Laura and others. And so I think, um, you know, lucky to have some momentum to keep going, you know? Yeah, well, we're, we're really fortunate that you have. And that clinical infrastructure that you describe for 
research, clinical application, and integrating these neuroscience and tool approaches, it seems like that could support all of these, or not all of them, but many of these new approaches that you're describing, like obviously what you're developing with the, the TMS tools, but the psychedelics, the other novel therapeutics, arguably could sit on top of an infrastructure like this if we work together. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I know I think... we... Sorry. I know, I know, I know we have um, shared thoughts about how that could happen and then have it integrated with the clinical activities as well, so that it, that adoption and the opportunity for new people to train, like as an interventional psychiatrist, the next Dr. Nolan Williams building the next generation of tools that becomes possible. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um... Yeah, it'd be great to there are a lot of talented folks and uh, really great to be able to figure out how to pass the well, pass which is I, I have no doubt we'll be looking back in the next decade and many to come in just how much of an impact you've had on the field because you're doing it. Perhaps you don't always see it, but you're really generating such motivation and excitement and inspiration in the field. Thank you. I see it. I, I hope you experience it. Um, I also see the hope that you're giving for patients. And I think that's that's really important. So I, I'm thinking of it as your approach to tool building is very much about solving really important problems that are right in front of us. Yeah. So it's a kind of very solution oriented approach, but sitting on top of an incredible depth of understanding about how the brain works and how you can take that and, and apply it. So I really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Um, I learned a lot myself and I know everyone listening will. To wrap up, is there um, any last thoughts you'd like to share or highlight? No, thank, thank you for for um, for having me and, and thanks for, like I said, for all the support over the years and really excited to see what you, you know, what you've been building and to be a part of, of, of the group and, um, you know, anything I can do to be, to be uh, helpful to the larger, you know, to the larger effort would be, uh, would be great. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing what happens. Yeah. Great. We'll come back for an updated chat when we have the, the next chapter. Sounds like a plan. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you. So thank, I'll say thank you from everyone who'll be listening um, for this wonderful treat and to hear from you. So thank you, Dr. Nolan Williams, for sharing your expertise and giving us this picture of just all the advances you've made and the future that I know you're going to realize. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks for the faith. Thanks, Lee.